Hi, uh, very good morning. So am I audible? Uh, is it streaming now or do you still have any issues? Okay, uh, so I'm, I'm still using uh, the headphones. Uh, let me know if the audio is fine. In fact, since we are very close to the uh, device, we don't actually need these earphones, but still uh, uh, to maintain the standards, I'm trying to use these headphones. Uh, the charging lasts for only one hour approximately. So our session might extend beyond one hour. So uh, once the charging is done, uh, it will be even uh, the same. The audio quality hopefully remains the same since we are closer to the device. Okay, so I hope it is streaming fine. So before we proceed, I have the following instructions for you. First and foremost, this textbook discussion, there are certain objectives. See, uh, it's easy for me to give you some multiple choice questions or it's easy for me to give you content in the form of key points. But the objective of these textbook discussions is to encourage each and every one of you to refer standard literature. That's the only, only objective we have in mind. And secondly, whenever you're referring standard literature, you always have this advantage of obtaining standardized information, which you can completely rely on without any second thoughts. So if at all there is a question from this particular topic, you can answer with tremendous amounts of confidence, take my word, okay? So keeping these objectives in mind, let's proceed with today's textbook discussion. But as I said, see to that, you're having either a soft copy or hard copy of the textbook. Uh, if you're following Malamed, I'm currently following fifth edition of uh, LA Malamed. So it's page number 291. So we'll quickly review through all the content and then we'll try to highlight various key points pertaining to this topic, right? We will specifically focus on local complications of LA, uh, especially trismus and hematoma. We'll deal with the causes, the problem prevention, and most importantly, the management part, right? So I hope you guys are ready. So shall we proceed? And also I have posted some information pertaining to this, like I posted the pictures of the current content which we'll be going through in our updates group so you can go through that right so if you have two screens you can use one screen to attend the live session the other screen to go through the content right so also see to that you're having your marker pens notes alongside with you so i'm sure by the end of this session we can collect tens and tens of valid important relevant points pertaining to this topic christmas as well as hematoma right so i hope you guys are ready shall we proceed okay fine yeah now, first and foremost, you know, there are local and systemic complications associated with LA, and I'm sure we're all familiar with them because uh, almost every one of us have given local anesthesia and we have seen, uh, based on our experience, we could have seen or we might have seen some local complications or very rarely some systemic complications as well. So we'll start with Trismus, okay? So page number 291, Malamit. Fifth edition. Okay, so as you can see, trismus from the Greek trismos is defined as prolonged tetanic spasm of jaw muscles by which normal opening of mouth is restricted, locked jaw. The designation was originally used only in tetanus, but as an inability to open mouth may be seen in a variety of conditions, the term trismus is currently used in restricted jaw movements regardless of etiology. So not just in tetanus. There can be other causes as well. So uh, one such cause we are dealing with now. All the post-injection pain is the most common complication, local complication of local anesthesia. Trismus can become one of more chronic and complicated problems to manage. I, I want you to highlight this particular point. Post-injection pain is the most common local complication of local anesthesia. So if I ask you this question, which is the most common local complication of local anesthesia? So obviously it is post-injection pain. Do underline that point, okay? Now let's move on to the causes. So as you can see, we have several causes. Trauma to muscles or blood vessels in the infratemporal fossa is the most common etiological factor in trismus associated with dental injections of local anesthetics. So trauma obviously is one of the factors. And then local anesthetic solution. See, uh, we can expect questions in this format here. So all of the following are causes of trismus except so you should be able to make out or rule out so local anesthetic solutions into which alcohol cold sterilizing solutions have diffused produce irritation of tissues leading potentially to trismus 
And local anesthetics have been demonstrated to have myotoxic properties. I wanted to underline this point as well. So they have myo or mycotoxic properties on skeletal muscles. The injection of local anesthetic solution either intramuscular or supramuscular or within the vicinity of the muscle leads to rapidly progressive necrosis of exposed muscle fibers. So mycotoxic, so consider this point very, very important. Okay, now also hemorrhage is another cause of trismus. So obviously uh, when there is accumulation of blood, which limits the movement or you know, opening of the mouth. So hemorrhage is another cause of trismus. Large volumes of extravascular blood can produce tissue irritation, leading to muscle dysfunction as the blood is slowly resorbed. And finally, even a low-grade infection. See, infection obviously attracts inflammation and there can be possible trismus as well. So all of the following are the causes of trismus. So you can just make a note. Trauma, the contents of local anesthetic solutions, local anesthetics as such because they have mycotoxic properties, hemorrhage being one of the causes, and even a low-grade infection, right? So I hope it's clear. Now let's move on to the next segment. Every needle insertion produces some insult to the tissue through which it passes, which is obvious. It stands to reason then that multiple needle penetrations, which obviously we do during practice, correlate with a greater incidence of post-injection trismus. So consider this factor very, very important, okay? Yeah, so the factor which we are talking about is multiple needle penetrations. So in addition, Stacey and Hazard found that 100 needles used for administration of IANB, 60% were barbed on removal from the tissues. The barb occurred when the needle came in contact with the medial aspect of mandibular ramus. Withdrawal of needle from tissue increased likelihood of involvement of lingual or inferior alar nerve and development of trismus. Excessive volumes of local anesthetic solutions deposited into restricted area produce distension of tissues, which may lead to post-injection trismus. And this is more common after multiple missed IA and base. So you can just make a note of these various causes and factors which can potentially lead to trismus. Okay. Now, Coming to the problem, although the limitation of movement associated with post-injection trismus is usually minor, it is possible for much more severe limitation to develop. The average interincisal opening in cases of trismus, you can do make a note of this point. The average interincisal opening in case of trismus is 13.7 mm with a range of 5 to 23. Stone and Caban reported four cases of severe trismus after multiple inferior alar or PSA nerve blocks, three of which required surgical intervention. Before surgery, the patients had a limited mandibular openings of approximately 2 mm, which is very extreme. That's why they mentioned it as severe. And here in trismus, we have two phases as mentioned here, acute and chronic phase. So in acute phase of trismus, pain produced by hemorrhage leads to muscle spasm and limitation of movement. The second or chronic phase usually develops if the treatment is not begun. That's the reason why we say, uh, we ask the patient to exercise and intentionally perform mouth opening exercises because chronic hypermobility is secondary to organization of hematoma with subsequent fibrosis and scar contraction. Then surgical intervention has to be done. So infection also may produce hypermobility through increased pain increased tissue reaction and scarring, okay? So these are the problems associated with trismus. So how do you prevent trismus? So using a sharp, sterile, disposable needle, because we have seen uh, barbing and also we, can, we have seen the problems associated with formation of barbs, or, or it's obvious that when you're not using a sharp, sterile needle, you're, you might actually induce some infection or as such, if it is not sharp, it can cause even more damage comparatively. And proper care for handle, uh, proper care for and handle uh, dental anesthetic local cartridges using aseptic technique, practicing a traumatic insertion and injection technique, which obviously comes with practice, avoiding repeated injections because we have seen multiple injections can obviously lead to excessive tissue damage, which uh, results in the formation of trismus. And use minimum effective volumes of local anesthetic. And refer to specific protocols and trismus is not always preventable. So based on the problems, I mean, once you understand the problems, you'll obviously know how to prevent the same. So prevention is one side of the coin. 
the other side is if at all there is actual christmas how do you manage that case so in most instances christmas the patient reports pain and some difficulty opening his or her mouth on day after dental treatment in which posterior superior alveolar or inferior alveolar nerve block were administered right so psa or ianb do underline these points as well and hinton and associates re- reported that onset of christmas occurred one to six days post treatment so again you can underline this point so when do you actually see trismus after injecting an la so the range is 1 to 6 days post treatment and the average is 2.9 days so around 3 days the degree of discomfort and dysfunction varies but it is usually mild with mild pain and dysfunction the patient reports minimum difficulty of opening his or her mouth arrange an appointment for examination in the interim prescribe heat therapy warm saline rinses analgesics and if necessary muscle relaxants to manage the initial phase of muscle spasm so the management part includes heat therapy warm saline rinses analgesics and muscle relaxants please make a note one of you were asking previously antibiotics are not necessary okay heat therapy consists of applying hot moist towels to the affected area for approximately 20 minutes every hour and for a warm saline rinse a teaspoon of salt is added to a 12 ounce glass of warm water and held in mouth on involved site and uh, spit out to help relieve discomfort of trismus painkillers aspirin 325 mg is usually adequate as an analgesic in fact we have seen in one of the study club discussions yesterday day before yesterday uh, that in case of mild pain we either go for paracetamol or aspirin the conventional nsaids in case of severe pain as you mentioned ketorolac uh, opioids uh, right so aspirin is suffice its anti inflammatory property are also beneficial on rare occasion codeine may be necessary 30 to 60 mg 6 hours if the discomfort is more intense so obviously as we discussed nsaids in the context of dental pain mild moderate or severe we give or prescribe medication accordingly diazepam 10 mg twice a day or other benzodiazepines are used for muscle relaxation if deemed necessary so it's very simple we either go for analgesics and coupled with muscle relaxants which has to be supplemented with heat therapy and warm saline rinses all of which would relieve the particular problem the patient should be advised to initiate physiotherapy consisting of opening and closing of mouth which we discussed prior as well as lateral excursions of mandible every 5 minutes every for 5 minutes for every 3 to 4 hours chewing gums is yet another means of providing lateral movement of temporomandibular joint so physiotherapy that's it and record the incident findings treatment of patient dental chart avoid further treatment in involved region unless or until symptoms resolve and the patient is comfortable if continued dental care in the area is urgent Uh, we're coming to a very important point uh, do underline this i'll let you know if continued dental care is necessary in that particular area as with an infected painful tooth it may yeah i think i skipped this part okay if continued dental care in the area is urgent as with an infected painful tooth it may prove difficult to achieve effective pain control when trismus is present which is obvious in that case vajrani akinosio mandibular nerve block usually provides relief of motor dysfunction so consider this very very important permitting the patient to open his or her mouth and allow administration of appropriate injection for clinical pain control if needed so in worst case scenario in the sense if the treatment has to be done if we have to address the painful tooth then we can go for this vajrani akinosio mandibular block where we are trying to paralyze we are trying to achieve motor block okay so consider this very very important and do underline this point and in virtually all cases of trismus related to intraoral injections that are managed as described patients report improvement within 2 to 3 days 48 to 72 hours again do or make a note of this point therapy should be continued until the patient is free of symptoms if pain and dysfunction continue unabated beyond 48 hours consider the possibility of infection so if the symptoms persist even after 2 to 3 days after uh, following all this protocol then you should definitely suspect infection right very very important 
antibiotics should be added to the treatment regimen described and continued for seven days. See, previously, as we discussed, antibiotics are not necessary. But in spite of implementing all of this protocol, and if the symptoms don't subside, then obviously will uh, go for prescription of antibiotics, as mentioned here, for a full duration of seven days. And complete recovery from injection-related trismus takes about six weeks with a range of four to 20 weeks. So consider this very, very important. So onset of trismus, as we have seen previously, one to six days post-treatment, according to Hinton and Associates, and an average of three days. But complete recovery. Uh, they are given the average value of around six weeks, which is more than a month. So it should be very much terrifying for the patient, but uh, the responsibility is ours, and we should, uh, you know, uh, reinforce uh, good things, and we should tell them that there is nothing really to worry about. So six weeks, we should be prepared, and with a range of four to twenty weeks. Okay, so twenty weeks uh, would be uh, really very horrible. In fact, uh, my wife had an impaction several years ago. And uh, she had this issue of uh, trismus for around two to three months, uh, post-operative pain, post-injection pain, whatnot. And uh, it's been a very horrible experience for her. So for severe pain or dysfunction, if no improvement is noted within two to three days, without antibiotics or within five to seven days with antibiotics, or if the ability to open the mouth has become limited, the patient should be referred to an oral and maxillofacial surgeon for evaluation. There comes a specialist. Other therapies, including the use of ultrasound or appliances, are available for use in these situations. Temporomandibular joint involvement is rare. In the first four to six weeks after injection, surgical intervention to correct chronic dysfunction may be indicated in some instances. So we cannot rule out this possibility of temporomandibular joint involvement. Okay. So this is uh, pertaining to trismus. The causes of trismus the problem associated and how we can actually prevent the same. See, it's very easy uh, to understand the preventive aspect once you know the causative factors. And also uh, management part, it's very simple. So we'll start with conventional therapy like heat therapy, warm saline rinses, analgesics, depending upon the pain level. So in case of severe pain, we obviously go for, you know, uh, these uh, uh, opioids, etc. And antibiotics are not necessary initially, but only when we suspect that to be of because of infection, uh, when the symptoms don't subside, then we go for antibiotics, right? And also, if even with antibiotics, if the pain doesn't subside, then we should obviously refer to a specialist to see if at all there is any further issue associated with uh, this post-operative injection complications, right? And also, we should not rule out temporomandibular joint involvement, right? So I hope it's clear. And in this process, we could underline a couple of important points, right? Including the role of Vajrani Akinosi mandibular nerve block and when it is indicated, right? So I hope it's clear. So we'll just take a two minute break and then we'll proceed with hematoma aspect, right? Another important topic, especially the management part to consider that very, very important. So we'll just take a two minute break and let me know how it is going. So are you able to follow? Are you able to follow or any suggestions? You're most welcome. So before the live session, I've actually posted some information in updates group so that it will be easy and convenient for you to follow. But any suggestions from your side, we're open. <laughs> Patient will sue you for what? Uh, take a, Obtain a consent before the procedure. So uh, that's what uh, Hare Krishna is asking is Christmas reversible. See, based on uh, literature review, it's obvious that there can be complete recovery. And we have seen the duration as well. Six weeks average or range of four weeks to 20 weeks. So, so it's obvious that there is and there will be complete recovery. See, that's the advantage we have with textbook discussions. You'll get all the information. You'll get complete clarity on that particular topic. Okay, so hematoma. So what is hematoma? So hematoma, as you know, is a collection of blood, localized, right? So the effusion of blood into extravascular space can result from inadvertently nicking of a blood vessel. It can be either an artery or a vein during the injection of a local anesthetic. A hematoma developing subsequent to the nicking of an artery usually increases rapidly in size 
until treatment is instituted because of significantly greater blood pressure within the artery right it's obvious and nicking a vein may or may not result in the formation of hematoma tissue density surrounding the injured vessel is a determining factor so if i ask you a question like which of the following definitely leads to hematoma formation nicking of artery nicking of vein nicking not licking so it's obvious right so as clearly mentioned nicking of vein may or may not yeah nicking of vein may or may not result in the formation of hematoma so consider this uh, point very very important and do underline it okay and causes of hematoma because of the density of tissue of the heart palate and its firm adherence to bone hematoma rarely develops after a palatal injection again do underline this point so hematoma is rare after a palatal injection for the following reason density of tissue as well as firm adherence to the underlying bone or rather large hematoma may result from either arterial or venous puncture after psa or ianb again do underline this point psa or ianb the tissue surrounding these vessels more readily accommodate significant volumes of blood the blood effuses from vessels until extravascular exceeds intravascular pressure or clotting factors hematomas after ianb are usually only visible intraorally whereas psa hematomas are visible extraorally again it's obvious do underline this point right so hematomas after ianb are visible intraorally hematomas associated with psa posterior superior alar nerve block are visible extraorally okay now coming to the problem a hematoma rarely produces significant problems aside from the resulting bruise which may or may not be visible extra orally as we just discussed possible complications of hematoma include trismus and pain do underline this point the swelling and discoloration of a region usually subsides within 1 to 2 weeks again do underline this point a hematoma constitutes an inconvenience to the patient and an embarrassment to the person administering the drug so that is psychological issue we have to deal with but coming to the actual physical issues trismus and pain are the associated problems okay right now let's move on to the preventive uh, aspect a knowledge of normal anatomy involved in post uh, proposed injection is important certain techniques have a greater risk of hematoma visible hematoma the psa nerve block is the most common followed by ianb and mental or incisive nerve block do underline this point and consider this a very 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 important first associated with or hematoma is most commonly associated with psa nerve block followed by ianb followed by mental or incisive nerve block that's it now the second point modify the injection technique as dictated by the patient's anatomy which means for example the depth of penetration for a posterior superior alar nerve block may be decreased in a patient with smaller facial characteristics that's what experience teaches us and using a short needle for the psa nerve block to decrease the risk of hematoma very very important point and minimize the number of needle penetrations into tissues which is obvious as we have discussed prior and never use a needle as a probe in tissues right okay so these are all the preventive aspects or preventive measures which we can undertake in order to uh, prevent hematoma either associated with psa or ianb or mental or incisal nerve block right consider this very very important and management part immediate management right and subsequent management so immediate management when swelling becomes evident during or immediately after a local anesthetic injection direct pressure should be applied to the site of bleeding so direct pressure so it's obvious and common sense that whenever you uh, come across and uh, you know even in movies and all you see whenever there is an injury or bleeding the first thing uh, the hero heroine does is apply pressure for most injections the blood vessel lies between the skin and bone on which pressure should be applied for not less than 2 minutes this effectively stops the bleeding do underline this point for most injections uh, the blood vessel lies between the skin and bone on which pressure should be applied for not less than 2 minutes so the minimum duration uh, for pressure application 
So two minutes. Okay. Should not be less than two minutes. Obviously, it has to be two minutes or more than two minutes. Right. This effectively stops the bleeding. So direct pressure itself is a mantra. Now, moving on to inferior alveolar nerve block. So we have various nerve blocks and the management in those respective nerve blocks. So inferior alveolar nerve block, as we can see, pressure is applied to the medial aspect of mandibular ramus. Clinical manifestations of hematoma are intraoral, so which we discussed prior, positive tissue, uh, I mean, possible tissue discoloration and probable tissue swelling on the medial or lingual aspect of mandibular ramus, which is quite obvious. Anterior, superior, or intraorbital nerve block. Pressure is applied to the skin directly over the intraorbital foramen. Clinical manifestations are discoloration of skin below the lower eyelid. Hematoma is unlikely to arise from anterior, superior, alveolar nerve block. Underline this point. Consider this very, very important. Why is hematoma unlikely with ASA block? Because the technique described requires application of pressure to injection site throughout drug administration and for a period of two to three minutes after. So consider that point very, very important. Incisor or mental nerve block, pressure is applied directly over the mental foramen on skin or mucous membrane. So pressure application wherever you see. Clinical manifestations are discoloration of skin or mental foramen or swelling in the mucobuccal fold in the region, sorry, in the region of mental foramen. As with ASA nerve block, Pressure applied during administration of drug effectively minimizes the risk of hematoma formation during incisive nerve block, but not no mental, uh, given the anatomical uh, uh, limitations we have. So wherever you see, it's obvious that pressure application seems to be the key in controlling the bleeding. And buccal nerve block or palatal injection, place the pressure at the site of bleeding. In these injections, the clinical manifestations of hematoma are usually visible only within a month. And finally, the most important aspect, posterior superior alveolar nerve block, uh, where we have seen that the hematoma is most common. The posterior superior alveolar nerve block usually produces the largest and most aesthetically unappealing hematoma. The infratemporal fossa in which bleeding occurs uh, can accommodate a large volume of blood thanks to infratemporal fossa. The hematoma usually is not recognized until a colorless swelling appears on the side of the face, usually a few minutes after the injection is completed. It progresses over a period of a days inferiorly, anteriorly towards the lower anterior region of the cheek, inferior and anterior. It is difficult to apply pressure to site of bleeding in this situation because the location of involved blood vessels. Uh, it's almost, it's inaccessible intraorally. You can just try, uh, try accessing, but it's almost inaccessible. It is difficult to apply pressure to the site of bleeding in this situation because of a location of the involved blood vessels. Which blood vessels are involved, we'll look into them now. It's also relatively difficult to apply pressure directly to posterior superior alveolar artery, the primary source of bleeding. Do underline this point. So PSA no block, PSA artery, right? So posterior superior alveolar, no, alveolar artery, the primary source of bleeding. Along with that, involvement of facial artery and pterygoid plexus of veins. Consider this very, very, very important. Okay. Now, moving on to the next point, they are located posterior, superior, and medial to maxillary tuberosity. Bleeding normally ceases when external pressure on the vessel exceeds the internal pressure or when clotting occurs. Digital pressure can be applied to the soft tissues in the mucobuccal fold as far distally as can be tolerated by the patient without eliciting gag reflex. Along with distal pressure, apply pressure in the medial and uh, the direction of distal pressure is medial and superior direction. If available, I should be applied extra orally to increase pressure on the site and help constrict the vessel. So why is the uh, eyes applied? So it's obvious here. And consider this point very, very important, especially the management aspect pertaining to posterior superior alveolar nerve block. And subsequent management, so this is all initial uh, intraoperative management. Subsequent management, the patient may be discharged once bleeding stops. Note the hematoma on the patient's dental chart. Advise the patient about possible soreness and limitation of movement, that is trismus. As we have seen, there can be complications such as trismus and pain. If either of these develops, 
being a uh, begin treatment as described for trismus and there will be likely a uh, discoloration as a result of extravascular blood elements which is gradually resolved uh, resolved or resolved over 7 to 14 days as we have seen prior so the swelling and discoloration of lesion usually subside within 7 to 14 days as mentioned in page number 294 if soreness develops advise the patient to take an analgesic such as aspirin do not apply heat to the area for at least 4 to 6 hours after the incident heat produces as you know vasodilation whereas cold produces vasoconstriction which may further increase the size of hematoma so why is heat not applied this is the reason and do underline this point consider this very very important okay and heat may be applied to the region beginning the next day it serves as an analgesic and its uh, vasodilating properties may increase the rate at which blood elements are resorbed all the its benefits are debatable the patient should apply warm moist towels to the affected area for 20 minutes every hour ice may be applied to the region immediately on recognition of a development of hematoma it acts as both analgesic and vasoconstrictor and it may aid in minimizing the size of hematoma so th that's the beauty we have ice or heat that as analgesics and also they produce vasodilation or vasoconstriction correspondingly time tincture of time is the most important element in uh, managing uh, hematoma with or without treatment a hematoma will present for 7 to 14 days as we have seen prior avoid additional dental therapy in the region until symptoms and signs resolve so one to two weeks duration okay so this is pertain to the management aspect now i will challenge you no matter which question i create from these particular topics that can be trismus or that can be hematoma you will answer them with 100% confidence with 101% accuracy take my word i'm throwing you a challenge and i'm going to create questions i'm going to give you those questions and i'm very confident and it's it has nothing to do with my confidence but the fact here is since you have gone through the textbook since you have gone through the standard information there is no chance of committing errors unless and until you're uh, ignoring certain points but if you follow the information given over here there is no way that you're going to commit any mistakes so that's the point i wanted to highlight so Uh, what shall we uh, guys do uh, shall we proceed with some of the topics further into this complications it's been around 40 minutes uh, like one of you said uh, needle breakage or some local complication or shall we conclude the discussion uh, it's up to you okay i think we can proceed yeah fine now uh, let's move on to the final topic of this uh, live needle breakage Uh, so since you have been requesting we'll proceed with the same breakage and retention of needles within tissues has become an extreme rare occurrence because of introduction of disposable needles however reports of needle breakage still appear despite the fact that virtually all instances are preventable it is estimated that dentists in the united states administer in excess of 300 million la cartridges annually which is not necessary for us at all given that in many instances multiple injections are administered with one cartridge the number of actual needle penetrations of intraoral mucous membranes occurring in the united states is exceedingly high probably in excess of 500 million a year just keep that aside in 30 years uh, this author has been involved in teaching of local anesthesia Uh, he has been involved with 34 instances in which litigation has resulted from broken dental needle retained in patient's mouth ankur here is your favorite topic so we're talking about case reports and all yeah they say 30 gauze needle causes problem uh, 27 gauze needle was another problem okay let's keep all that data aside what we'll try to focus is on the actual problem yeah we can just check out page number 286 last left side last but second para uh, in many cases of retained broken dental needles there is a strong clinical and scientific evidence that needle has been bent by the doctor uh, for your understanding you can just underline this point before its insertion into the patient's mouth okay so iatrogenic 
in each and every case of retained broken dental needles, there was one factor universally present. The needle had been inserted into soft tissues its entire length. Guys, I want you to underline this point and I'm going to repeat this point once again. In each and every case of retained broken dental needles, there was one factor that was uni universally present, that is complete penetration of the needle. The needle had been inserted into soft tissues its entire length. INB in typical adult patient requires soft tissue penetration to a depth of 20 to 25 mm. Do underline that point because the tip to hub length of short dental needle is approximately 20 mm. It is evident that these needles had to be inserted to their hub to reach the inferior alveolar nerve. So there is a reason why we're trying to insert the entire needle because of the shorter length. Needles, when they break, always break at the hub the most rigid portion of the needle. So there are two important points which I wanted to highlight in this particular part of discussion. The one factor which is universally present in all cases of retained broken needles is the entire length of the needle has been penetrated into soft tissues, number one. And number two, needles, when they break, they always break at the hub. That is the most rigid portion of the needle. So consider these two points very, very important. If the needle is inserted into soft tissues to the hub when it breaks, the elasticity of soft tissue produces a rebound and needle is buried. The syringe is removed from the mouth with the needle no longer present. If a long dental needle had been used for injection in question and the needle had still broken at the hub, they would remain still visible in patient's mouth. Approximately 7 to 12 mm of needle that could be easily removed from the mouth with a forceps. So that's the advantage we have. Uh, we, ha we have obviously with this long needles, right? So if a long dental needle had been used for injection in patient and the needle had still been broken at the head, you'll have an advantage of grasping the additional length of uh, the needle and retrieve it using a forceps. That is approximately 7 to 12 mm of needle. If a 25 or 27 gauze needle had been employed instead of 30 gauze needle, which is very much fine, the likelihood of needle breakage at all would have been negligible. Again, two additional factors, the length of the needle and the gauze, right? So these two factors also play an important role in the chance of needle breakage and the ability to retain a needle or remove a needle after a breakage, right? So consider these factors very, very important. So there are four important points which we have seen so far, okay? I hope it's clear. Now, coming to the causes, the primary cause of needle breakage is weakening of dental needle by bending it before its insertion into the patient's mouth. So what is the primary cause? Needle bending. So do underline this point, which is already given in italics here. Another potential cause is sudden unexpected patient movement. Obviously, as, a, as we're trying to penetrate the needle, if the patient's movement is opposite to that of needle, the force of contact may prove adequate to break the needle, especially if previously bent, and if the needle is finer, that is 30 gauze. This is more likely to occur in pediatric dental patients. Smaller needles are far more likely to break than large needles. So uh, you can expect questions based on true or false. So as you can see, smaller needles are far more likely to break than larger needles, 30 versus 25 gauze. Needles that have previously been bent in an attempt to direct them more accurately into the tissue are weakened and more likely to break than unbent. So bent versus unbent. And the third factor is needles may prove to be defective in manufacture, which is exceedingly rare and unlikely cause of needle breakage. So we can't blame the manufacturer, okay? So you find needles and uh, bending of needles uh, seem to be the probable common causes of needle breakage. Now coming to problem. Needle breakage per se is not a significant problem. If a broken needle can be retrieved without surgical intervention, no emergency exists. A magal intubation forceps or hemostat, do underline these points, okay? A magal intubation forceps or hemostat can be used to retrieve, to grasp the visible proximal end of the needle fragment and remove it from the soft tissue. Needles that break off within the tissues and cannot readily be retrieved either with a hemostat or a magal intubation forceps do not migrate, yeah, 
if they do not migrate more than a few millimeters, they become encased in a scar tissue within a few weeks. Localized or systemic infection produced by such needles is extremely rare. Electing to leave a needle fragment in the tissue instead of attempting its removal usually leads to fewer problems than the extensive, involved, and often traumatic surgical procedure necessary for its uh, removal. So as, but as Ankur said, what if patient sues you? But uh, risk versus benefit analysis, it's all about risk versus benefit. So it's better to leave it there if at all uh, there are no associated complications than to perform invasive procedures in an attempt to retrieve them. More recently, however, removal of broken needle has been considered to be warranted primarily because of patient's fear of needle migration, but also because of legal considerations. To, uh, to simply put, just shut up and remove the needle. You cause the problem, so come up with some solution. In addition, removal of needle always allays the psychological worries of both patient and practitioner. Okay, that's fine. Understood. Prevention. Using large needles. So since we know the problems, uh, we obviously can uh, expect and uh, obviously understand the preventive aspects also. Uh, using large gauze needles for techniques requiring penetration of significant depths of soft tissue. That is 25 gauze 25 needles are appro appropriate for an inferior alar nerve, mandibular, posterior superior alar, anterior superior and maxillary nerve block. So do underline this point, right? So 25 gauze needles for the following nerve blocks, PSA, ASA, maxillary nerve block. And using long needles for injections requiring penetration of significant depths of soft tissues, usually more than 18 mm. And do not insert a needle into tissues to its hub unless it, it is absolutely essential for success of technique. Because we have seen that the hub is the most rigid portion and that's where most commonly the fracture happens. The breakage happens. Uh, breakage happens. So do not insert a needle in tissues to its hub unless it is absolutely essential for success of technique. The point at which the needle shaft meets the hub is least flexible, weakest part of the needle, and the site at which the needle breakage occurs. Consider this very, very important. Do underline this point. Select a needle of adequate length for contemplated procedure. Do not redirect a needle once it is inserted into the tissues. Do not probe tissues. Excessive lateral force on needle is a factor in breakage. Withdraw the needle almost completely before redirecting it. If you are planning to redirect it, withdraw it completely and then redirect it. Okay, I hope it's clear. So it's very simple to understand uh, since we're trying to correlate that clinically. And the management part, the final aspect of needle breakage, Shaira has presented a description of management of broken needles. A summary of his prudent suggestions follow. First one, when a needle breaks, remain calm, do not panic, at least externally. Instruct the patient not to move, do not remove your hand from the patient's mouth. Keep the patient's mouth open. If available, place a bite block in the patient's mouth. If the fragment is visible, try to remove it with a small hemostat or magal incubation forceps. Uh, quite obvious and logical, right? But very difficult. Uh, how can you remain calm and not panic? But uh, you have to. Uh, you have to uh, not choose those options. Okay? And if the needle is lost and not visible and cannot be readily retrieved, do not proceed with incision or probing. So don't try to be a superman, isn't it? A superwoman. Calmly inform the patient. Attempt to allay the fears and apprehension. Note the incident on patient's shot. Keep the remaining needle fragment. Inform your insurance carrier immediately. Uh, uh, it seems irrelevant here. Refer the patient to an oral and maxillofacial surgeon for consultation and for removal of, not for removal of a needle. And when the needle breaks, consideration should be given to its immediate removal under the following conditions. The needle is superficial and easily located through radiological and clinical examination. Removable by competent dental surgeon is possible. Despite its superficial location, attempted retrieval is unsuccessful within a reasonable length of time. It is then prudent to abandon the attempt and allow the needle fragment to remain. But patient has to be informed. The needle is located in deeper tissues or is hard to locate. It should be permitted to remain without an attempt at removal. 
In many instances, attempted removal of broken needle is performed in the operating room under general anesthesia. There is considerable precedent to justify the retention of broken needle if the removal appears difficult. Unfortunately, the likelihood of litigation ensuring, uh, uh, ensuring or following after a broken needle incident is high. The patient will not keep quiet, obviously. Right. So uh, these are some of the important points pertaining to needle breakage. So we can definitely make out a couple of points, like five to seven points maybe pertaining to this. Right. So I've underlined the same and I hope you have gone through the same uh, in the process of this textbook discussion. So the length of the needle, the gauze of the needle, the techniques and the corresponding gauze to be used and the most uh, common reason for break is the bending of needle and also the location of uh, breakage, which is at the hub, right? So we have discussed all these factors, the preventive aspect and the management part, right? So which is quite obvious. And for sake of retrieving, we have come across two instruments here, hemostat as well as, or a magin intubation forceps, right? So consider these points very important. So it might take Sometime like we have spent around how much time did we spend now? 50 minutes. 50 minutes to go through the complications, especially pertaining to trismus, needle breakage, and hematoma. 50 minutes, but when you do it personally, uh, since it is live, I've been doing it comparatively slow, but when you do it personally, it hardly takes 30 to 40 minutes. So, 30 to 40 minutes is not a waste of time. Because now it might take 30 to 40 minutes, but the second time you revise, since you have all the key points highlighted, it takes hardly 10 to 15 minutes. And the third time you revise, hardly 5 to 10 minutes. And before exam, 2 to 3 minutes. So notes preparation involves one of this as your component. Notes preparation doesn't just mean that you have to write down all the content in the given notes. It also means that you can use sticky notes in order to paste them wherever necessary or you can even use a marker pen to highlight certain key areas in your textbook right so as you can see certain key areas can be highlighted sticky notes can be pasted and if you can real i mean if you have that willingness to do then we'll never complain about time constraints having said that it's always not possible to complete the entire textbook but at least based on practice based on a level of understanding it's obvious that certain topics are important so we can focus on them and to be more specific and to be more practical for suppose you come across a multiple choice question on needle breakage so if the question is which is the most common site of breakage of needle the distal third, proximal third, middle third, or near the hub. So if at all, these are the options. So you know hub is the answer, or you don't know the answer, you come across the answer as hub. All you need to do is just open the following section. Allot some 10 to 15 minutes time to go through that topic precisely, underline relevant points, and then that's it. So that's retrograde preparation. Instead of going from textbook to your MCQs, you can do it retrograde. That will actually save your time, enhance your confidence because you're using standard literature as a reference. And as I said, most importantly, when you refer a standard textbook, the amount of confidence you have is unmatchable. I mean, uh, you know the actual scope, the actual content, the reasoning behind the given points along with valid information and it's guaranteed that you will never make a mistake, right? So I hope the objective of textbook today's textbook discussion is fulfilled. So even, uh, even if it's not possible, as I said, to go through the entire textbook, incorporate uh, these steps, especially when you're practicing multiple choice questions or going through any videos or going through any assignments as such. The assignments in specific are created, keeping these in mind. These are the main objectives. So when questions are given, it's not just about finding the right answer, it's about referring standard literature. And when you refer standard literature, along with one point, you'll get several additional points, which will ultimately enhance your confidence. And most importantly, before your exam, it's going to save your time, right? So now you took 15 minutes. Do you think it's going to take 15 minutes? As I mentioned prior, it hardly takes five to 10 minutes to go through the same topic right? So there is plenty of time. 
it's all about careful planning and implementation right so when you wish to do it you'll do it when you think it's difficult it always remains difficult okay and in fact this textbook discussion is one of my favorite parts in teaching even in college uh, i ask my students to get textbooks and i make them uh, see if there are 10 to 15 in a particular group i make each one of them to go through a particular section or para and then we'll have discussion so that way uh, everyone will get exposed to this textbook uh, reading get used to referring standard literature which will ultimately elevate the confidence and raise the standards obviously isn't it right so you can consider this as a model and uh, we'll see if we can do more textbook discussions in the coming weeks and also we'll incorporate more of, it's already we have some textbook discussions in our e classes we'll try to incorporate more and more of these in your e classes in the coming days for sure because as i said this is my favorite part and that's the secondary thing but the primary thing is that's how actual learning happens and when we post these videos uh, in e classes i will see to that i'll post all the uh, background information like right now in this live i posted that in updates group similarly we'll have all this authentic information displayed in the backdrop while i'm going through textbook discussion so that it will be much more convenient for you to follow whatever we're going through right so i hope you enjoy today's discussion see when i say enjoy today's discussion uh, people some people often get confused some people think drinking alcohol is enjoyment uh, playing games is enjoyment but each one has their own way of enjoying things doing things which we love is a form of enjoyment so last night or a couple of days ago i was playing some indoor games ludo and snake and ladder with my parents and i just enjoyed it that's fun definitely i've attended this discussion it's been fun interacting with all of you and then going through standard literature so enjoyment is all about doing what you're loving and simultaneously having that good feeling if you're having a good feeling when you're doing some things or anything so obviously you're enjoying it So I hope you enjoyed today's discussion, and for any further queries or assistance, you can always get back through mail at twenty four by seven. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes, Vaishnavi, definitely I'll consider uh, your request. Yeah, Mrunal, this is Malamed. This is from Malamed. ram yes we already have list of books i already we already have a draft mail you can just drop a mail we'll send you the list of books to be followed maxillary and mandibular fractures uh, obviously we had this mandibular fracture fractures topic as live last year or last before year uh, but anyways i'll definitely incorporate them in our e classes e classes we're still working and uh, based on time availability we'll come up with more and more videos and post them as soon as possible yeah questions yeah i'll create the, i need to create the questions yeah i'll create the questions but as i said i'll guarantee you that you're going to answer each and every one accurately okay so why can't i do it tomorrow i think i'll do it tomorrow So tomorrow's live session will have questions from this topic, from today's uh, textbook discussion. So let's see how it goes. Yes, sir. We already we have point and shoot tests on fracture management, but definitely will consider your request. Uh, guys, uh, since you have been asking me, I I, I will definitely consider your request. Uh, but you know i would love to do uh, i would love to do whatever you ask for uh, even though there are many challenges uh, there is no point in complaining but definitely i'll consider all i can tell you is i'll definitely consider your request i'll definitely consider your request okay yes sure
dry socket i'm sure i'm sure uh, it's uh, available but i need to check once i need to refer once falak but dry socket we already have it in uh, shafers right yeah sure so whatever topics you're telling me i'll definitely consider discussing them and i'll post them in e classes okay i'll try my best Uh, just to give you a glimpse of how my day goes one of you have asked me yesterday i had spent uh, literally 6 to 8 hours only to answer mails yesterday yesterday only to answer mails 6 to 8 hours so you can uh, obviously understand uh, the load which we are taking up but as i said this is not to complain as i say it's only to give you a glimpse but uh, the the point here is as uh, the going gets tough the tough gets going so i don't uh, really like to complain so i'm not complaining i'm not that kind of a person but rather i would take that as a challenge so i'll not say no to any one of you i'll definitely consider your request okay yeah sure sure definitely i'll make a note of all the topics which you have been mentioning now and i'll try my best to incorporate them in our e classes okay just give me some time we'll definitely have them we'll uh, have them in any means possible mcq discussions or in the form of textbook discussion or in the form of a, a conventional uh, recorded uh, lecture whatever the means is i'll try my best or even in the form of assignment okay so i'll try my best to get back to you Uh, in fact uh, in fact i wanted to share with you guys uh, for the past two or three weeks we're having this regular live which is an additional work for me uh, my life has become all of a sudden a very monotonous uh, waking up early in the morning preparing for live session uh, getting done with live session checking up mails uh, going through all the tests and discussions uh, it has become so monotonous that i felt like i should do something which is different Uh, then anku and tenku idea has come up to some extent it has helped me to overcome my passivation because uh, uh, when you have, when you have that passivation it's all a form of negative energy but if you can divert that negative energy into positivity uh, that definitely works so uh, there are several means of doing it but i decided to use it uh, to channel that negativity towards the study club discussion that's the reason why in spite of mentioning certain topics in session objectives we were not able to complete all the objectives because uh, anku and tenku's conversation was taking some time so i decided not to rush that's the reason why we only discussed uh, one or two objectives of that particular session the rest of the uh, rest of the topics i will get back through e classes as i mentioned but the point which i'm trying to make is uh, see lockdown the scenario it's really quite challenging passivation is quite obvious uh, feeling a sort of depression it's quite obvious but if we are smart enough we'll try to channelize all that negativity uh, towards positivity uh, if you have that willingness you'll obviously do it so uh, i'm telling you i've done it by channeling all that negativity in the form of anku and tenku's conversation and you see tenku scolding anku tenku saying shut up shut up anku so uh, when when i use those words it's actually provide, <laughs> providing me some relief i must admit so so that's how anku and tenku have actually come up but as i said uh, they have been to south pole on some scientific uh, experiments science projects so um, hopefully they'll be soon or they might conduct a session right from there so i'll let you know guys see the reason why i have been sharing all of this is uh, i have seen instagram uh, by the way I, i i deactivated instagram from my phone uh, quite a while ago when i've seen instagram i've realized that what we actually see in the picture is in complete contrast to what actually is in the real world we try to project as if we are very happy we are uh, very well uh, doing everything perfect 
But that's not always the reality is because we want to project ourselves in good light. But let me admit, uh, days are not really good for me. But still, I'm telling you, if uh, you have the potential and if you can channelize all your negativity towards positivity, you will definitely overcome everything. And as I said, I've been going through one of the books called The Power of Subconscious Mind by Carpenter, who clearly says that as humans, we cannot avoid negativity. There will be negativity. And on top of it, we are in a kind of situation where uh, we're dealing with some pandemic. We are forced to stay in homes for our own good. So times are very challenging. Situations are very challenging. But still, as I said, as clearly mentioned, your brain, your subconscious mind will perceive negativity. There's nothing wrong in it. But the real challenge lies in overcoming it. And then as one of you, uh, I've seen some of you actually sending me uh, some artwork, some poems, some homework. See, when you involve yourself in positive distractions, that will definitely help you overcome your negativity. You cannot eliminate negativity, but you can overcome your negativity. For sure. Take my word. So that's the reason I keep on telling you, involve yourself in positive distractions. Uh, social media is very bad. I uninstall everything. I stopped following all the news. I only watch prime time news. That too, I've been not watching for the past two days. My life is really good now. So the point which I'm trying to make here is, of course, we'll have negativity. Of course, we feel demotivated. But the most important thing is exhibiting resilience. It is during these challenging times that we need to give our best. Uh, we need to focus on giving our best because complaining doesn't help. See, I might complain, I might say I'm having a lot of work, I don't want to do this, I can point out fingers, but ultimately who is at loss? Uh, so that's something which we all need to think over. And uh, I'm really amazed to see uh, that right from day one of our breakfast sessions, I've been seeing uh, tens and tens of you sending me homework on a consistent basis. See, uh, that's possible only because you're willing to do it. So the point which I try to make, which I'm trying to make here is, it's okay to have negativity, but see to that you're overcoming that with the positive stimulus. And I appreciate all your love and affection. And I hope this session is informative. And again, we'll come back tomorrow at 10:30 a.m. Indian Standard Time with MCQs discussion from these topics. I'll create MCQs exclusively from these topics. You can attend the discussion and you will be giving me all the answers and explanations. Take my word. Yeah, you know, you don't know Anko and Tenko. Anko and Tenko are my neighbors. I mean, they're just behind that door. I mean, if you observe, but don't try to go in. It's a washroom. But behind that, we have our neighbors, Anko and Tenko. Gulshan, is it necessary to do block of intraorbital RCT of upper four or five because patient feels discomfort after IO and B? Uh, Gulshan, are you talking about the clinical aspect or the theoretical aspect? Yes, I uh, appreciate your love and affection, guys. Uh, I should say I'm really blessed. Okay. So what else? Okay, okay, guys, let's conclude our uh, session then. And you have any questions, you can always get back through me.
to doubt clarification form you will get a reply within 24 to 48 hours okay so wish you all the best and love you all i'll see you again tomorrow at 10 30 a.m in standard time take care bye Yeah, okay. Yeah, love you all too. <laughs> Do your family complain because you're not giving them time? Who said I'm not giving them time, Ram? <laughs> yeah, of course, you're right. I'm not giving much time to my family, but still... Um, they do understand. They do understand that I have certain things which are uh, far more important to deal with. So that's the advantage I have. That's an edge I have. The family which is understanding. <laughs> okay, okay guys. Take care. Bye.